Good afternoon. Today is May the 4th, and we're continuing our discussion of, there we go, of World War II uh, in the Pacific. So let us begin, shall we? I hope that you all have been enjoying uh, our ventures into both the life of Puyi as well as, of course, Pearl Harbor. We're going to finish Pearl Harbor today and see if we have time left over for the lecture of Pearl Harbor first. So uh, at the same time Pearl Harbor was being attacked, the Japanese were also in the midst of creating their empire by conquering much of the Pacific Rim countries, the countries that surround the Pacific, the Philippines, the coast of China, Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia, um, Burma, uh, Indonesia, and they had in mind Australia. So uh, they took Guam, where there was an American military base, Wake Island. Uh, the Philippine Islands, where there was another large American military presence, held out longer than expected against the Japanese invasion at a place called Corregidor, and in doing so, upset the Japanese timetable for conquest. The Americans and their Filipino allies held on there for two months longer than Japanese had allotted for the conquest of the Philippines. And when they finally surrender, of course, one thing you need to learn about the Japanese, if you'll pardon me while I get a drink. <coughs> The Japanese consider themselves, uh, their, their soldiers at the time, considered themselves samurai. And to the Japanese, uh, all soldiers live under the code of conduct of the samurai called Bushido. And Bushido is a very strict uh, disciplinary code which basically says that it is better to die than to accept defeat. In fact, if uh, a soldier knows that he's going to be defeated, he should take his own life. And so for the Japanese soldiers, they couldn't understand soldiers who surrendered. They felt that these people ceased, uh, ceased to have the right to be considered human beings. And so when the Americans surrendered, the Japanese then were in charge of 70,000 American soldiers that they marched over the course of six days through the hot Philippine jungle to a POW camp in what is called the Bataan Death March. Um, it was called the Bataan Death March because a lot of American POWs died either from uh, malnutrition. Those students that were waiting for bus eight seven six. It is now arrived. Malnutrition, dysentery, thirst, I mean, but the big killer was Japanese abuse. For example, uh, the Japanese taught, uh, seized every opportunity they could to be abusive. For example, you know, an American soldier walking, dying of thirst would see like, you know, uh, a, a deep place, a hollowed out place in the road, and it'd be a little pool of water in it, and the guy would jump down and try to drink. And the Japanese soldier would behead him right there for doing it without permission. Now, Alvin Powellite, Alvin C. Powellite, uh, adds a local flavor to the Bataan Death March. Alvin Powellite was a Fort Thomas native. Yeah. In fact, if you've ever driven on I-275 East, and if you know, familiar with the, uh, where the town and country soccer center is, where 275 crosses the Licking River, where Kenton County changes into Campbell County. That bridge is called the Alvin C. Powellite Bridge, and it's named for this guy, a guy who's, who survived the uh, Bataan Death March, um, largely because, one thing, he knew some Japanese. Part of option, Cheryl Darvel, if you're in the building, please call 71309. Thank you. Aside from uh, knowing some Japanese, he also was a doctor. He was an ophthalmologist, and, but he also knew what plants you could eat and what plants you couldn't eat. And he also smuggled in his shorts a small bottle of aspirin that helped him tremendously. Uh, but, you know, by knowing Japanese, he could ask the Japanese soldiers for a drink of water 
they would let him get that. Uh, though he gave another account where there was this uh, pig who wandered in around the POW camp, and when nobody was looking, he took a rock and hit that pig in the head. And, you know, the pig starts staggering around before it dies, and uh, Corporal pa or Lieutenant Powellite told him that the, uh, the pig was sick, and so the Japanese wouldn't eat it, but they let the POWs eat it. Well, anyway, uh, so let's leave those guys there at Camp Wagner in the Philippines for a while in what were terrible conditions. General Douglas MacArthur had to leave. He was commanded to leave the Philippines, but he promised, I shall return. The Japanese also drove down through Southeast Asia, conquering Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia. Thailand had allied itself with Japan, as well as they also conquered the British colony of Hong Kong and made their way southward and took the very valuable colony of Singapore. I think I have a map for that, if you would pardon me. Pause time. Okay, let's go, uh, uh, we're back, and let's go back to the map I just pulled up, shall we? Um, which is here. All right, now those countries I was just talking about, this is the Philippines, and this is Corregidor. Uh, this is Southeast Asia, the colored area here. The blue, that's the long one is Vietnam. This is Laos, this is Cambodia. The gray one is Thailand because Thailand actually allied themselves with the Japanese. This magenta is, is uh, Malaya. And what you don't see here, there's the, one of the tiny, smallest countries in the world is at the tip of the Malay Peninsula called uh, Singapore. The Japanese seized it. And what's interesting, uh, the British had the port of Singapore really well fortified. The problem was all of their fortifications pointed out to the ocean because it's, as you see, it's a very, it controls a very important straits of Malacca through here. Kind of like owning the exit to an interstate ramp, as you might imagine. And the British never believed that the uh, Japanese would attack overland because all this land here is impenetrable jungle. And the Japanese actually hacked their way through the jungle and actually then made their way all the way down to Singapore and captured Singapore and thousands of British civilians whom they put into POW camps and were not kind to. The Japanese then moved on to, this is Dutch Indonesia, which the Japanese took over as well. Okay. Um, yes. So, as it says there, what was incredible about their conquest of Singapore, the, like I said, the British never believed that the Japanese would march all the way through, all the way through that long jungle uh, area and to get to the island uh, of Singapore, which they did. Um, so, now when they did conquer Singapore, they took all these British prisoners, and the film or movie book Bridge on the River Kwai talks about British POW is building a railroad bridge for the Japanese. It's an interesting story, it stars Alec Guinness, but it's hardly truthful. After Singapore, the British drove, uh, the Japanese drove into Burma with the ultimate goal of taking India, which was referred to as the crown jewel of the British Empire. When we watch, uh, finish, go back to our last emperor, Pu Yi film again, There'll be a scene where that Japanese guy, Mr. Amakatsu, will tell the emperor and his wife, we're taking all of Asia. And he goes and he names the country, uh, Indochina, Burma, uh, India, and then he says, Asia belongs to us, yeah. Okay, although the Japanese seem unbeatable, the Americans, for Pearl Harbor, and the Australians, to save themselves from the likelihood of invasion, wanted to strike back. This here, 30 seconds over Tokyo, it's actually the name of the film, but uh, the Americans wanted to strike back at the Japanese, and they wanted to strike back now, right after Pearl Harbor. And so they came up with an amazing plan, whereby they would put American B-25 medium bombers on the deck of an aircraft carrier and then strip those bombers down so that they could take off of an aircraft carrier, fly over Japan, and make a bombing raid, and then land and or crash in China. And yeah, they were able to do that. 
Now, it really what didn't have much effect militarily, except to let the Japanese know that, uh, you know, the effect actually did more for America morale than it did the Japanese. And then the next is the Battle of the Coral Sea. Go back to our map, right, right here. Coral Sea is right here between Indonesia and Australia. And the Japanese had planned to invade Australia, make it a Japanese colony. Uh, they, the United States fleet and the Japanese fleet, or what was left of the United States fleet, and the Japanese fought to pretty much a standoff. The, and each side had to withdraw, but the importance of it was that it actually stalled the invasion of Australia. The importance of the Battle of Midway, Midway. Midway is uh, an interesting battle because it was the first battle ever fought where the fleets did not come in contact with each other. Yeah, all the fighting took place between carrier-based aircraft. And I mean, that's a thing. Uh, if you ever played the movie, played the, the Milton Bradley game Battleship, that game was actually designed it was a copy. It was basically it was inspired by the Battle of Midway. I mean, have you ever played Battleship? You know, you ha each have two uh, the two little boards, and they're hidden from your opponent. And then you place your ships on the board, and then you take turns calling out coordinates. And you know, the winner uh, is the one who sinks the other's battleship. Well, see, in, in actuality, you can go now. In actuality, uh, the game should have been called Aircraft Carrier because, you know, uh, in the real Battle of Midway, each fleet was looking for the other fleet's aircraft carrier. And uh, the object was you sink the other guy's aircraft carrier and his planes have nowhere to land. And, yeah, and fortunately for the United States in the Battle of Midway, by luck, pluck, or whatever, um, the American scout planes were able to find the Japanese fleet before the Japanese scout plane found the Americans. Actually, the Japanese scout did find the American fleet first, but his radio was busted, and he couldn't radio back. Why did it turn the tide in the Pacific? Well, because from that point on, from that point on, the... Americans began producing war material at a faster and faster rate. In other words, it, the Americans produced more and more war material uh, in shorter intervals at a short during a shorter period of time, and uh, the Japanese could not produce any. I mean, after that, every time the Americans lost a battleship, they'd replace it with three, or a plane, replace it with ten, or anything. The, the Japanese, on the other hand, whenever they lost a battleship or a plane, it was lost. It was just lost. And so Japan, from that point on, was on the defensive. The goal of the island hopping campaign was to isolate Japanese pockets of resistance, take over all the islands that had airstrips, and pretty much leave the others alone. Guadalcanal was the first island. Okay. We will talk about more. We'll finish this. We'll go back to Europe after we finish the film, uh, Pearl Harbor, which we already have. But I'm going to stop here. Thank you.